All right. So welcome, welcome, welcome. It's Wednesday, January 18th. Uh, welcome to the uh, Ontario Real Estate Legal Discussion Group uh, third annual Crystal Ball Report um, for 2023. I guess I guess it's not the third annual for 2023, but it is the third annual report. Um, and uh, thrilled to be here with everyone um, and uh, see that we have quite a few people who have joined us. So we're going to be joined today by three esteemed speakers. You probably know them by reputation alone. Uh, we have Ron um, from Butler Mortgage. Uh, everyone knows Ron. I don't really think I even need to introduce Ron, but I will for the sake of listening to my own voice. Ron is 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 uh, the granddaddy of of the industry, uh, and I don't mean that in an age component. I mean that. In the... Yes, you do. Yes, you do. <laughs> you you I, goddamn, I you goddamn well do. I know you do. Okay. Pure knowledge, pure knowledge, Ron. I mean, really, he's a guru for those of us who are trying to find a guide forward and figure out where we're going. He also, of course, does a huge amount of volume, bringing great insights and having his finger on the market. Uh, we have Dan. Um, and Dan uh, recently actually has been uh, promoted and uh, taken on a new position with Rare as their director of research. Is that correct, Dan? I hope I got that position correct. Yeah, economic research. Perfect. And those of you who know Dan know that anything that comes out of his mouth is well researched, uh, well thought out. You may agree, you may disagree, but you're not going to uh, you're not going to be able to argue with the facts that he brings out because they are they are, as I said. Uh, extremely well documented research and of course there's Jordan Jordan who has made a uh, who runs pre condo um, actually give, uh, this past year we did a session with Jordan and we had one of the most um, viewed sessions of our of our careers and they basically if you want insight into where we are in the new build market he is the man basic uh, one last minute these sessions are public uh, even though our forum is private uh, so be advised that anything you say or anything that we say will be posted in a variety of public locations. Uh, and so I'm letting you know our group has over 11,000 people in it now. Thank you, everyone. Please add your friends if they're professionals. And without further ado, I'm going to get started. So I'm going to start, if you don't mind, with a bit of a round robin. Uh, I'm going to give my quick two-minute prediction. And then with permission, I'm going to turn to Ron. And Ron, you'll kick off uh, the first of our three uh, predictions. And then maybe we can have a free flowing discussion, which is the purpose of today. I know all four of us have spoken in the past on a variety of forums, and it should be very interesting. Um, I'll start with my prediction, if you don't mind. Just I'm going to take on the host and uh, and the uh, and the I guess the privileges that come with that for a second. Uh, my prediction, and I'll be very quick about this for 2023. I note, by the way, our prediction in 2022 was largely accurate. Many of us who were here for the crystal ball session. Uh, actually had a bit of a depressed view, and we thought that the market was massively overheated and that a correction was overdue. That correction has obviously come to bear. So where are we in 2023? Uh, my, my take on things is that we are going to see a softer landing than what would have been the case, given the way that we're seemingly poised to kind of come out of this mess. Um, presently, we have a variety of factors that are coming to bear. We have a loss of the investor class. The investors are sitting on the sidelines and smart capital pools are now assembling to take advantage of people in distress as opposed to investing in pre-con or uh, paying ridiculous cap rates. We have loss of the FOMO buyer, first time home buyers that were betting anything they could and taking on their family's leverage uh, simply to get into the market. There's no disadvantage to wait. Uh, there's of course the pre-con wind down an asset dumping that's taking place with people who should never have purchased in the first place and we're purchasing on speculation. And we have the destruction on the periphery markets uh, amongst the MIC lenders and the likes in, in single detached Uxbridge and things like that, uh, where we are seeing effectively um, huge price declines. And what this means effectively is that if you think about our market as a balloon, sure there's heightened immigration, flooding more and more water into the balloon. But there's enough holes in the balloon, I think, um, that the balloon doesn't increase in size at all, um, that the water that's going in is flowing out. And this means that people that are holding on to their properties as the incentive to maximize profit is disappearing, um, people are basically holding on to their properties for longer periods of time. And this is, of course, augmented by recent government change over the past year, um, which has made it largely less profitable uh, to flip properties. 
And when you put that all in the, in the scope of inflation running at about seven or eight percent, if what we have are people who are holding on to properties, and if inflation continues to go up, what we have is a mass um, and, and somewhat less painful way of devaluing properties, because just all things being equal, you hold on to a property and it has the same price, but money is worth 7% less that year. Well, we've deflated the property values by 7%. Uh, you know, when we talk about the fact that property values have fallen 12% or 15% in the past year, you know, we should also account for the fact that inflation has reared its ugly head, meaning that there's a, a more significant drop than even that. So I do think that there is a broad-based way that we can absorb this pain through inflation, particularly if prices remain uh, the same. There will be acute areas of pain that we will discuss here today, but that's my prediction for 2023. So Ron, my prediction aside, I'd be very interested in hearing what you have to say about the subject, and then we can turn to Dan and then Jordan, and then we can just open up to a conversation. Sure. Uh, there's aspects of this that are unknown. Uh, chiefly that will will the Bank of Canada this year engage in suggestion that they will reduce rates, they'll cut rates instead of raising rates. This is a big unknown. I mean, this, some of the stuff is, is simpler than we think. This is math. Uh, anybody who we look at to buy a house, was interested in buying a house and look at the math of what they can afford, what their payments are going to be based on these high rates. Well, and let's get the historic rate BS out of the way. Um, historically, the, these are historically normal rates, uh, with the sole exception is that they are ridiculously goddamn abnormal house prices. Uh, these house prices did not exist. The ratio between average family income and house price never existed like this in the past. This is a whole new thing that wasn't anywhere before and therefore the impact of these these rates as they sit today is very significant so until that starts to turn uh i i don't have any good predictions i mean if they do not turn if uh if we don't know will will gas prices go to to, to 210 in uh the summer and all of a sudden inflation is back and Tiff Mathen starts throwing on a couple more quarter percent increases. We don't know those things. We don't know those answers. We just don't know. So um, the only thing I can tell you for sure, 5% interest rates don't work with these house prices. So either the house prices have to continue to come down or something breaks. Uh, the, the major recession, medium recession, something goes wrong and there's pressure on the bank to reduce rates. All I can tell you is at 5.49, it's very hard to make the prices in the GTA or the lower mainland work and for the average, for just even well-off people. <laughs> that's that's going to be what remains to be seen for the next 12 months. Okay, terrific. I have a whole bunch of questions, but we'll turn to them in a second. Let's, let's move to Dan. And Dan, can we hear your predictions so far? And then we'll, again, go to Jordan and open it up. Hey, uh, yeah, absolutely. So I would agree with most of what what Ron said. I think, you know, we're of this perspective in in Canadian real estate that it's binary, right? That the market's either going down or it's going up. And the reality is past housing market corrections would tell us that the market can trade sideways for a very long time. Even 2017 being the most recently accessible example, we saw house prices accelerate to levels of mania that were you know, relatively comparable to what we saw just recently. And, and this is in the GTA. And prices started to come down um, after the non-resident speculation tax was put into place. You know, you can't really necessarily be blamed on it. There was changes in the rate environment as well. And the market sort of traded sideways from the end of 2017 until the beginning of COVID, as we started to see an easing in rates and then emergency monetary policy, uh, you know, kind of really, really ramped that up. I would say that had COVID not happened, it would be arguable that um, 2017 might have been the peak of our housing market, uh, but we kind of got back on that trajectory and, and kicked the can further down the road. Um, you know, everybody would say today that it's different because you know we have record levels of immigration well the last time that we hit a record 
level of immigration on a quarterly basis was in, in 1989. And everybody knows what happened thereafter in regards to house prices. So I'd say that, you know, most economists agree that Canada is due for a moderate recession. Um, I don't think that that's what's going to cause prices to continue their downtrend. I think the reality is buying borrowing power has been erased by, you know, let's say 30%. And that will have impacts on long-term impacts on house prices. The reality is that we're not going back to emergency monetary policy rates. So it doesn't really even matter if, again, there's this binary notion that the Bank of Canada is either increasing rates or decreasing rates. Well, they're not decreasing them. If, if they if rates ever go back to where they were, we have far worse problems. Like, you know, maybe the US got involved in the war in Russia or something like that. Like there's I think you have other things to worry about. Interest rates would kind of be the last thing that you'd be thinking about in, in that respect. And so the question becomes, what is a what is it? this being our new normal interest rate environment look like for house prices? Well, we know that there's a reduction in, in borrowing power and we know that, that has is going to have a sustained impact. And to me, I think, you know, we're seeing it and I'll, I can present some data when we get into the conversation um, through, I can just share the screen on my video here, but I think that somewhere between what happened in, in the 1980s and the 1990s would be, uh, you know, what would be my prediction of what we'll see in, in Canadian real estate. I think prices will grind down for, the, the rest of this year at a national level and especially at a locally local level. And then I think we'll be poised pretty well for recovery in regards to like 2024. I think Korea is, is predicting that we'll start to see volume ramp up again. And I would agree with that. And I think then, you know, your more normal, sustainable price growth will continue thereafter. But I think you're probably in for a, a relatively long bottom in likely 2023 and 2024. Um, Last piece is just, you know, price. I think it will be down from today to this time next year. That would be my guess. I don't think it's going to be down significantly. I think that the big high velocity crashes have, you know, are already behind us. Uh, but I think that the market will grind down slowly as we start to adjust to these new interest rates. And that's a good thing. You, you know, you don't get people caught between transactions losing, you know, there's a hundred or two hundred fifty thousand dollars spread on what they sold for, what they bought for. Um, and, and this is a healthy market that people should be encouraging one another to, to, to make safe transactions. The downside risk is behind us as prices come down, the, the risk that's, that's above you, uh, or sorry, the upside above you is higher. So you have more upside and there's l less downside. So the lower price gets the safer the market is for most market participants. So that's my two cents there. I hope that makes, makes some sense. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Dan. Um, all right, Jordan, you're up. Yeah, look, I more or less uh, echo Dan and, and Ron's uh, sentiment. Like, I think short term, the reality is where rates go, prices will follow. The majority of the pain has likely already been felt with one caveat being, I don't think the majority of the pain in the assignment market has yet to be felt. And Mark, you can speak to this a little bit more too. I have never seen so many condo assignments on the market. I know it's even worse in the freehold space because the build cycle is a lot shorter. But in terms of condos, you know, they're projecting 32,000 completions this year. I'll be the first to tell you, we're not going to see 32,000 completions in the GTA. We're going to see probably 25,000. That's still a lot of condos coming to market. And most of those are purchased by investors, right? So a lot of that will transition to the rental market, which is good. It'll help stabilize and bring down rents a little bit, I think. Um, the big question mark for me is how many people bought condos that they couldn't afford to close on and intend to assign them? Um, because those people are, are in some cases already taking losses. So I'm seeing people let go of their condo assignments for 2019 and late 2018 purchase prices in many instances. So we're talking about core product. We're talking about stuff that people bought, you know, on Young Street downtown, people are selling for what they paid four or five years ago um, and eating the 5% commission and the $5,000 assignment fee, if any, or whatever. Um, and I'm seeing similar things across. It doesn't really matter where the condo was purchased, Etobicoke, Scarborough, whatever. I'm seeing people let go of them for you know 20 late late 18, early 19 purchase prices in many cases. Um, and then you know people who bought in 2017, they're still making some profit. There's still room there because uh, they bought at like you know seven to nine hundred bucks a square. Um, so they still have there's still equity in those deals. Uh, but that's sort of my question. I mean, the good news is look. 
I'm still not seeing more than 10% turnover on a building. So you have a 400 unit building coming up for closing. You're still going to see less than 40 assignments at the market. So it's not this overwhelming amount, but it's, but there's mo very few assignments are catching bids. Like people have to price very aggressively. Right. Uh, I had 70 units close in December. Um, most of them closed without a hitch. Some people, a couple people had to go to privates. Uh, one person we had to assign. There were probably seven or eight other individuals who we had listed for assignment, but they were prepared to close if need be. Um, but again, the bigger question for me is just how many of these units that are coming up for completion can't afford to close? Um, so, I mean, that's really that's really just my piece. I mean, the long-term story looks as good as ever. Last year, look, we were supposed to see 35,000 new condos launch from developers last year. We only saw about 24,000 actually launch, right? So developers are looking at the market sentiment going, we can't hit our 70% sales target because you have to remember they have to hit a sales target in order to start construction. If investor demand isn't there, and I'll be the first to tell you it's not, new launches, if pre-con agents are out there telling you, oh yeah, we're getting worksheets like crazy, they're full of it, they're not. Um, new launches are pretty much crickets, it's a slow and steady grind. So pre-construction sales are going to be very slow this year because of rates, because of market sentiment. And so a lot of developers, primarily the big ones who like don't need don't need to launch, they're just not going to. And so you've got this all-time high population growth at the same time as developers cutting back and saying, well, let's just le launch less new product to market and wait till, wait till things improve. So, you know, the four or five year time horizon of condo build cycles looks pretty good because it's like population growth through the roof, but far less new completions in five years as a result of what's happening today. But in the short term, none of that matters. In the short term, rates are going to make the story here. Very interesting. Yeah, for me, the assignment market is the fundamental instability that I cannot fathom or understand. I think part of that is a lack of quantifiable data. We just don't know how many people bought for the purposes of assignment. I mean, we know what they said, but what they actually meant are two very different things. There are many people who only when push comes to shove, do they say, well, I really can't afford this. And I certainly can't afford it at these rates. And so the question is, what long term wind up do we need to now unwind what uh, over the course of the next five years or so while we're waiting for condo product to finish. I think that is an unknown. And I think that's probably for me, one of the things that makes the future the blurriest, uh, just as, as I'm trying to figure out where we're going. Ron, what Ron, Dan, uh, Jordan, anyone please fill in. I mean, we just heard from Jordan on this. Where do you think the most instability exists in the present market? Where do you think the most uh, danger um, exists presently? Well, I want to, I, 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 because it's an area that I think there is some danger, I want to come back to Jordan and ask him a question. So as we proceed through the year, we have the potential for more slow grind down in condo pricing. And we are going to start to have, as we get to the end of the year, we're going to start to have people who bought more recently. So will the crunch come in the last two quarters or the last quarter of the year when people are saying, I can't close, it doesn't make any sense to close, and I, I give up? I mean, I, I know that's extrapolating way out distant, but are those? is it going to come to the, to the issue of if these prices just keep grinding down for the whole year, will it become a more serious issue? Yeah, 100%. The longer we trade sideways or grind down, the 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 newer the condo purchases get right and so the less spread on price because 2017 through 2018 condo pre-con was pretty reasonable 2019 onwards things started the delta between resale and pre-con increased but yet if you look at sort of our peak pre-pandemic condo prices to today they're the same so we've had almost three years of no appreciation so 100 percent, you're right the the quite if we trade sideways for long enough i mean we're in a world of hurt for sure Okay, so there, so there you go. There's a there's a, a dangerous area that I think is was well illustrated by Jordan, and the next dangerous area is as long as HELOC rates and variable rates stay high, and we have continue to have this doubling of interest rates for people who are in alternative lending, we're going to see some more power sales. I mean, we're already seeing more files hit lawyers' offices. So there's your two areas, two areas that are. Not well, un not well understood because there's not great data, but have some crappy trends associated with them that could lead to more trouble. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think like the power of sales is one of the big questions. Um, I did just 
uh, like the chart beside me right here, I pulled this up uh, to to see whether or not there was a trend happening in in the data. And you can see an uptrend in in power of sales. It's it's obvious, but this the reality is they're still very like they're really not meaningful data points. It, you know, we're seeing 25 of thousands of monthly listings on, on the Toronto Real Estate Board uh, having power of sale. And I think that if, you know, right now, I think many participants in the market are trapped between this lose money fast or lose money slow paradox. And we know that there were many investors who were buying cash negative properties. And as rents continue to, to decline, or sorry, rent, sorry rents continue to stay where they are, but uh, capital costs continue to accelerate, you get people who are no longer making you know, good economic sense of investments. And capital appreciation is now off of the table. It's kind of like the US in 07, 08, not, not obviously as messy, but where you could always borrow against that equity, or you could always lean on that equity to, to, to rationalize that the investment still made sense because on exit, you'd have some equity. Um, I think at, at this point, you know, this similar to what Jordan's mentioning in the pre-con market, the market doesn't need to even go down. It just needs to not be going up for a lot of investments to not be viable pre-construction and existing buy and hold rental properties that really only made sense in record low interest rate environments. And so, you know, one of the things um, I'm just going to try and pull up this other. So one of the things that you can see here is the national average cap rate from you know it's it's tracked here by CBRE, but you know it typically trades in in a predictable channel. You know, let's say like 300 to 500 basis points above the Canada ten year, and it you know in Q3 of 2022 was 272 basis points, and you can see pretty predictable corrections thereafter where that spread normalizes and and people you know or investors start seeking actually realistic viable returns until the like it's similar to where the interest rate if the interest rate is net negative against inflation so if you can borrow at net negative rates then you know you're you're in an economy where it's just it's it's literally the financially better decision to lever up and spend your money on doesn't even matter what because like that's that's it's then the money will cost you less than the rate rate of inflation cap rates are, are the same thing it, until cap rates are above the interest cost then I don't think that we have much like there's still room for valuation to to correct. And, you know, a lot of people talk about the market as if investors are going to to create the price floor. I, I would agree with that for the most part, but I think we're still a lot further away from that than what most people would imagine. So the the question becomes and the variable that you're sort of asking is what happens to speculators? What happens to all of the people who you know, reconfigured investment to to be about capital appreciation. Like the way, the easiest way to think about it is, if your investment didn't make sense without capital appreciation, it's not an investment; it's a speculation. So, what happens to the people whose speculation, their speculative investment thesis failed, and they have to offload the asset at a loss, carry the asset at a loss? How that plays out, I think, is really, from my perspective, what. Like how distress materializes? Does it happen in power of sales, or does it happen in investors racing to the bottom because they still have equity padding? And you know, in in the U.S. 2008, a lot of these investors were leading the charge because they saw all these power of sales and or foreclosures in the states hitting the market, and there was a race to the bottom scenario. So, do we see a race to the bottom, or do we see it's more of a slow grind out through power of sales? Um, that's the big question mark in the resale market, from my perspective. There is another question mark that I just want to add to the equation, particularly for power of sales. You know, we have a something brand new in this particular um, in this particular uh, downturn is that over the past five years we have added to qualify as opposed to drive to qualify. Right? We've added mom, dad over and over and over again, such that it's now That's not true. a single person. <laughs> It's not a single person who's going, it's the family unit that goes down through a power of sale. Uh, I wonder to what degree that's actually slowing power of sales and in fact, in toning people to take the slow burn, um, which again, puts a bit of the brakes on the on the devastation that we would have ordinarily experienced. Ron, do you have any comments on that? I'm, I'm interested to hear. Well, I'm glad you brought up the point that in 2021, uh, every Bank of Canada agreed that it was the highest incidence of multiple people, more than two people on a mortgage application that had ever occurred in the history of the country. This was, this was spectacular. 
the amount of extra people that were added to mortgage applications to make it possible for the for the deal to fund. So you, you make a good point, but here's the thing. Right now, we're not seeing a ton of, of bank-oriented uh, power of sale activity. Uh, it will come, but it's not what we're seeing today. I think you'll agree, Mark, what we're seeing today is private lender, uh, private investor putting, uh, they, they want their money back. They don't want to renew. And that means that's not a question of being in arrears where mom and dad can jump in and and try to save the day by throwing some money at the kids to make the payments on the mortgage. This is an investor who's saying, I've got a $200,000 second mortgage and I don't want to renew. So you need to give me the 200 grand or I'm going to throw you out of the house and sell it. So that's what we're seeing the most starting files today. I think that's I think that's a common experience of anybody in the remedy business that the incoming files are from on the private side. They're not on the institutional side, although there will be a few coming from the alternative lenders. And there's probably already some in the funnel. But this is the interesting thing. This is the beginning of the pri of the power of sale cycle right now it has nothing to do with the banks. It's to do with others. And it's not necessarily about payments. It's about give me my money back. And that's something we actually haven't seen too much of in the last 25 years. There. Uh, Jordan, you want to weigh in? Or should I turn to a question? I think we can go to question. All right. I'm going to read two of the questions that have been posted here. Um, Ivar asks, how much impact do you think mortgage renewals will have on the market? I mean, that seems squarely wrong. So I'll, I'll turn it over. Sorry, say that again. How much Ivar uh, is asking? How much impact do you think mortgage renewals will have on the market? Well, you know, they're not. It's not going to be as ridiculous as people think because when people are coming out of fixed mortgage, the, the pain is already occurring in the variable side. Uh, that's already happening. These people watch their payments go up. You know, literally quarter every two months, their payments go up. Every six weeks, their payments go up. Uh, and the people who have got static payment variables, the variables where the, the with TD or with RBC or with CIBC, where those those payments don't go up, they're approaching a moment. We saw one yesterday that had uh, a 60 year amortization because they're, they they don't pay a penny toward principal. And those are all going to break soon. I mean, they're all that's if, if they're not in they're in the process of breaking. RBC and, and CIBC are reaching out to people and saying, hey, uh, your payment doesn't cover the um, doesn't cover the interest anymore. You're going to come up with some more money. Now, for many of those banks, you only need to increase it. Like you just have to beat the interest by like 20 bucks or two bucks or some number. So you're not faced today with massive increases. But for the people with fixed rate renewals coming up, and that's about 13% of all mortgages this year uh, are going to are going to renew. Fixed rate mortgages are going to renew. And they're going to see a jump that they probably haven't imagined they were going to see. They're going to see but about a a uh, 30% payment increase. And how that shakes out, it should be okay. Uh, bank mortgages are well-regulated in this country. Almost all these people were exposed to, were, were qualified with a stress test. And I don't think it's going to be a disaster. Uh, the disaster is going to be leveraged people. I mean, if these rates don't come down, if we get another quarter percent increase uh, next week, and we got people with big HELOC exposure. They're going to be up to like 8%. Um, I, that's, that's nobody ever thought that that would happen a year ago. So there's specific areas there's going to be trouble on renewal. Um, one thing I'm noticing in my practice, and, and you, if you would have asked me if this is the case, I would have been very surprised a year ago, um, is that builders, and Jordan, maybe you can speak to this, Builders are becoming incredibly difficult to deal with as times turn down. You would think that a builder would ultimately be giving more leeway on extensions and the like. But what we're actually seeing is the opposite, where the builders are becoming incredibly hard-nosed. I had someone who asked for a one-month extension and was tried to, they tried to hit him up with $65,000 in costs on a $600,000 condo. And this is not unusual. When I spoke to the builder, it turn or some of the builders. It turns out that the reason for this is because capital pools, having nothing else to do, are now lining up behind the builders and saying, "Hey, let's take advantage of distress. Help us take advantage of distress." 
Jordan, can you speak to this? Because I'm finding that builders have turned nasty in this environment and are not ready to work with us as people are experiencing hardship. Uh, yeah, it's brutal out there. Even some of my closest developer relations, it's very hard to call in a favor right now. Very, very hard. I'm talking people I've sold, you know, 100 units in a year for. It's very difficult to call in a favor. Um, I think I think there's multiple reasons. Um, part of it is part of it is what you said, but I think another part of it is if you're completing a development today, then you were building it over the past two or three years. Your IRR no longer looks so great if you sold that thing in 2017, 2018. You probably broke even, maybe you lost money. I was speaking to a developer who sold two towers, 2017, 2018, both 350 unit towers. They're closing right now. Um, and basically what, what they told me was, if we didn't hold back 25% of our inventory, we would have had to cancel this project because every deal we signed in 2017 and 2018, we lost money on, right? So I think, I think developers, which seem, this seems to be a story across developers and consumers right now, everyone's just trying to lose the minimum amount of money as possible. Right. And so I, I think uh, I think that's part of the reason why they're playing hardball. And they certainly are. It's un, it's kind of unbelievable how hard it is to get extensions and, and favors. And yeah, it's difficult right now. That, that's an interesting point. I never really thought about it. But, you know, it's worthwhile pointing out that when builders borrow money from the bank for construction financing, it's always on a variable rate mortgage. It's never on a fixed and it's always um, it's always done by uh, at the end the day, I mean, they're they're effectively facing much higher costs on their borrow. Uh, and you know, and I, they're I sorry to cut problem. you off. And the materials, right? Because because they their pro forma is based on 2017, 2018 projected prices on their materials. They don't order everything right away, right? And these construction bids are usually like cost plus, right? So like they have they're they're not making what they thought they were going to make. Yeah, and that, and that's also why you're seeing cancellations, right? And why we'll continue to see cancellations. And the trade the trades didn't get cheaper either. So it's yeah, it's just all comes together. Dan, anything you want to add, or should I move on to the next question? Yeah, I think you know on both accounts, um, and I'll I'll try and just pull up a chart here. But um, on on both accounts, like I think that there's a lagging effect to you know what John, uh, sorry, what Ron was mentioning about um, the the renewals. I, like I think that that's when I talk about it being a long bottom and this taking a lot longer for people that than people would think, and that it isn't just like a binary down bottom and then an up. We're in recovery. I think a lot of that is because of these renewals. Like you will see that over time, you're going to, you get more and more people who are renewing at higher interest costs. And what that materializes to is money being taken out of the economy that's going towards debt servicing. So RBC just put out this report recently, regardless of what you think on, you know, their, their forecast on the housing side, on the, on provincial GDP, it's really interesting for 2023, their forecast is BC is barely going to see growth and Ontario will be the only province that will see a decrease in, in provincial GDP. And to me, this is a problem when you have, like, this is the manifestation of uh, economies that are massively overexposed to housing. So you get people who are take, pay, putting more and more money, I think in, in Ontario, it's something like 13% of our, our GDP is, is residential investment. So that's basically real estate commissions and home renovations, let's call it. Um, we've seen decrease in, in building permits. So a lot of housing is being taken out of the economy. And that's been a major economic driver for a place like Ontario for the past, what, 20 years. Um, as that happens, you start to see, and, and we know on the volume side, like real estate, resale, re, resale real estate transactions are down like 40%. Um, it's going to suck. Like really it's going to. And I think that that's the part that people are missing. It's like, yeah, it, you know, prices, house prices are like, whatever. Everybody survived the nineties. People who were over levered, a lot of them lost their shirt. Like real estate is not a bad investment leverage and going levered long on real estate is the bad investment. And leverage is what is what crushes people. Real estate typically does fine over time. And, and I think that as we start to see more and more of this capital cost increase being realized over time. And in three years, you've got everybody now paying the, the new interest rate environment. Okay, now we can think about what a recovery looks like because we're sort of like past that lagging effect. But I think that until then, it's just more and more money being taken out of the economy, being used to pay interest rates and service debt. And that to me, you got Ontario being the biggest part of Canada's economy takes a lot out of the Canadian economy, right? So I think that's that's the part that a lot of people are missing. It's like, this is a moderate recession led by housing in a lot of cases. The consumption is going to decrease progressively throughout this year. 
I, I read something just yesterday that said that the primary driver of inflation uh, in this country is actually housing prices. And given that I now- well, ha housing, housing and rents, yeah, it's 40%. Yeah. Housing and rents, yes. So I, I was trying to figure out, uh, it, it almost became an inception sort of game when I started saying, well, okay, well, how does that affect the economy when, or how does that affect, excuse me, the housing market when it's the housing market that's drives, driving the inflation? And it becomes almost it becomes almost circular, but we are seriously embroiled in 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 the housing market in a way that is now fundamentally driving all of the features of this 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 cycle of the economy for sure. Um, Ron, um, there's a question that's been asked, uh, which I think a lot of people want to know about. I'm hearing about further tightening of mortgage rules and approvals. Uh, do we think this will cause a short term spike in purchases? as currently approved buyers jump into the market? We should realize that there's already some tightening, but just at the edges. There's lenders are thinking about, you know, going a little deeper on income, a little more careful checking. They're more interested in, well, this seems like, an, an you know, we're, we're not so crazy about a uh, the, about lending it to 80% on a second home in Peterborough right now. And we should cut this back to 70. Uh, you know, there's there's just m very small things. What OSFI is proposing, the bank regulators proposing, is it's obviously because they're a group of um, specialist nerds and ac former academics. They want to make it as complicated as humanly possible. That's almost incomprehensible what they're talking about but in a general way they're saying well we need to tie even though we've had um we've had debt ratio servicing for years we need to tie lending and total lending in a in a in the, the of the borrower more closely to their income we need because obviously they've discovered that they've got people who have three rental properties and you know if anything ever happened on in a vacancy basis, there's no relationship to their income. I mean, the amount of debt they carry toward in relationship to their base income is, is mind boggling. So they're thinking about how are we going to pull it closer? The number they use is 450%. How are we going to pull uh, total lending closer to 450% of income? And, and that's a, um, that's a change. That's going to be less people who are going to qualify for more, just unless, prices come down even more. So uh, it's going to take six months. It's going to be, you know, because of who they are, it's going to be hard to understand what finally comes through. Some of the banks are going to fight parts of it. And let's face it, when they when the regulator says we're going to go speak to our stakeholders, they're really only talking about five CEOs. That's who they're going to talk to. Okay. They don't give a shit what anybody else thinks. Okay. So there, there is going to be some changes we're going to see by, by the end of the year. Um, and they, they won't be certainly any good for people who want to purchase homes. So we will see more of that. Just a quick reflection on something that's been the, the last topics that were covered. It's a really interesting thing to understand in Canada. We've gone for about 14 years in Canada, where the vast majority of people, when they receive their mortgage renewal information, their renewal rate was the same or less than the previous, the previous sign up. So that's been going on for 12, 14 years and almost and, and almost right across this country. Either the same, very close to the same, or less. That's changing. That, that, is, that, that is to your point about we're going to pull more money out of consumption and into maintaining mortgage payments in the next two to three years. And that's not good, particularly for an economy that's as focused on real estate as Ontario. And you know, the, the one thing about the Lower Mainland of British Columbia, there's a lot of cash activity there. Like Steve Stresky would tell you, there's a lot of people. These are just people with pools of money. Uh, but for in Ontario, no, it's going to be, it's going to be not fun for uh, a lot of people when they get that renewal for the next, at least for the whole, next 12 months, and probably for another 24 months, when it's always going to be more money, more bigger payment than it was. So those two things are our are, are consideration. Jordan, can I turn the uh, conversation to you? I, I'm interested in hearing, uh, you know, your gearing uh, for the 2023 year. You obviously have decided who your targets are for the pre-con space. Who are they? Who are you? Who do you feel is, is going to be purchasing pre-con this year? Um, who's shying away from the market? 
what are you what are you doing in the SEO space uh, in that regard? I'm very interested in hearing how you're prepping. Yeah. So, I mean, look, from the SEO space, uh, web traffic is stable, man. We're still going to hit a million visitors this year. So people are still looking, right? They're still, the new launch comes out, they Google it, right? They're still looking for new condos in Toronto. What's different? And they're still registering for the projects at the same clip. The difference is just when you get on the phone with them, the price, there's a lot of resistance to price, despite the fact that the launches this time last year were the same price. Um, and, you know, you're getting a thousand worksheets for them. Um, we're as a team, like we're trying to advise people who have capital ready to take advantage of the market, not to buy pre-construction, frankly, you know, new launches are at a 20% Delta over resale at best case. So you're paying a 20% premium. And my assumption for the next year is we don't see any appreciation in the condo space. I don't think we're going to go much lower, um, but I, we're certainly not going to, going to rip through the roof by any means. So basically my advice, to the average investor is, okay, well, you know, if you have 25% cash sitting there, 30% cash sitting there, de deploy it into an assignment, look for the most distressed seller you can, put aside the shiny new objects and the shiny new launches because you're going to pay such a premium at those. Um, and then some people will come back with, well, then I have to close today. I have to take a tenant today, negative cash flow today, probably. And also I have to take out a mortgage today. And so we have to tell those people as well, does the $150,000, $200,000 discount on your unit offset those changes? Like, does it offset that? Does the math work? And of course, for most people, it does, which all, also follows with the question, well, Jordan, I don't have 30% cash. I only have 5 or 10%. That's why I like pre-con. And it's like, okay, well, if you only have 5 or 10% cash, do you really think buying right now is for you at all? Anyway, like, regard, like, do you think that that's a smart decision? Um, and for most people, the answer is probably, probably not. Um, so what, I mean, more or less what I've told my team to do is like brace for lower impact. The good news is who's still buying pre-con. We're still selling 1.5, $3 million units quite frequently, um, more frequently than we were this time last year. So the sort of downsizer, sort of the life cycle, like, um, you know, life cycle purchases. So not people speculating on pre-construction, but rather just, Hey, I'm looking for a terrace unit in this very specific, you, you know, pocket and I need 1400 square feet. Well, it doesn't exist on the resale market because inventory is so thin and that product might not exist at all because it hasn't been built yet. So they're still buying pre-construction because they don't really care if they're paying a 20% premium. This is probably the last property they're going to purchase in Toronto. So those people are still buying, but the entry level investor just really, they're, they're not, right? They're spooked and rightfully so they should be. Can you give us also some insight while, while I have you here? Um, on my screen. <laughs> Can you give me some insight as to what's happening on the single detached townhome products in the peripheries? Because it strikes me that that's where the most pain is taking place. I I, I pity the builder that's building out there and trying to sell. Am I right? Yeah, I, pitying them? yeah I mean, I don't do a whole lot of freehold stuff. I like my, I like my high rise. Um, and, but I'll tell you like from the CB, like CBC, Bloomberg and CP24 have all quoted me recently in articles and the amount of phone calls I got off of those articles from people in literally impossible situations. Like it's very rare to not have an answer for someone, you know, people are calling me saying, Hey, I bought a freehold townhome in February of last year, pre-construction for 1.3 million in North Pickering. Um, I would like to assign it how much of my deposits can do you think I can get back? And my answer is zero, none of them. We'd be lucky to even assign it in a position where you walk away free and clear from the deal and lose your full deposits. So it's very rare. It's a weird market. It's a weird time when people call you and it's like, hey, unfortunately, I don't actually have an option for you. There is no option. The option is to come up with the cash because this is going to appraise short. So come up with the cash and close or just take the hit, try to take the hit and move on. Um, and that's part of the, and that's why I've always kind of liked condos a little bit more because the five-year build cycle insulates us a little bit, right? So it's, it's bad out there. Um, yeah, that's all I really have for that. I mean, I will say this much though. I do have a lot of assignment buyers looking to capitalize on, on freehold product. It's just the, the prices they're looking for and the seller expectations just aren't aligned right now. Dan, do you have anything you want to add to that? You look like you had something you want to say. I th well, I just think that, you know, it, it is interesting. Like, to me, it's really just a question of like how distress materializes, right? Like we're at, um, I think we're at 
depending on the city, uh, affordability, household affordability rates, either comparable to 1989 or, or 1981. Um, I think Toronto's exceeded, Toronto's exceeded 1981. Uh, Vancouver hasn't exceeded 1981 yet. Calgary is doing fine, uh, well below 89 and uh, 81 peaks. Montreal is kind of just getting to their to their 81 peak. Um, incomes like something. There's only really only three levers in this equation, right? It's interest rates, prices, or income. We know in- the Bank of Canada is pretty hell bent on destroying job vacancies, so we know incomes aren't going up. They want to avoid a wage price spiral. Like that's a pretty big macro theme. We know interest rates are probably not going down anytime soon, right? Like at least, you know, you can say two quarters likely that before we see cuts based on the current outlook. So what needs to change? Well, if you look at housing affordability, historically, prices come down as a result of that. We already saw it, a big portion of it happen, but it still hasn't brought us to affordability where the, the market needs to be. The question then becomes, okay, if prices start or continue coming down and we don't get to a recovery situation sooner rather than later, how does distress materialize does it materialize in you know sellers or or owners selling at a loss or trying to to lock in their equity does it materialize in power of sales and and i think like i I actually wonder i don't know the answer to the question but i think that like the their big opportunity for professionals in the space for investors in the space lies on the other side of that question it's like should you be you know cold calling lenders to try and get power of sale deals right now or should you be cold calling all of your buyers from five years ago and asking them if they can afford, if they're cash flow negative and if they want to offload right now? Because, you know, there's there's going to be transactions happening over the course of this year, even if it's down fifty percent. It's just where where are they? Is the big question. All right, Ron, I'm going to ask you the question that you hate to be asked, but you're asked every time you you take a step. So here we go. I'm renewing today. Fixed variable. What's the period of time? What are you recommending at the present time, given given the circumstance that's sort of uh, that presents itself in today's market. Two year fixed. Two year fixed. This seems that was easy. <laughs> it makes me really happy because I just renewed on it. Or I, I just did a purchase on the two year fix. So that's nice. Nice news. It, uh, in other words, yeah. I'll, it, if, if you know how the if you know how our world works, you would say two year fixed. I mean, that's just that's just the way it goes. I mean, like two years from now, there's a reasonable chance that rates will be lower. It's a re- it's not a guarantee. There's no guarantees, but it's a reasonable chance that rates will be lower. Um, and yeah, that's all we tell everybody. Some people say, no, one year, give me one year. I want to roll the dice. I think it's going to be, I think things are going to get back to normal faster. Some people are a little bit more cautious. They say, give us a three year. The, the demand for five year fixed, uh, with the exception of high ratio, uh, 5%, 10% down stuff, the demand for five year fixed rates is, uh, not great and the demand for variable is only for people who have some sort of uh, mental defect that's it <laughs> okay <laughs> i wish you had said that 10 minutes later because i think that's an ideal way to that that last sentence is an ideal way to head off but we have 10 more minutes so i'm going to keep going um all right um so Gents, thank you. Thank you for this. I, I think what I'm going to do is if anyone has any questions, because we have a lot, we're in the last 10 minutes now. Um, I'm going to allow people uh just raise your hand. I'll call on you. Um, ask your question to one of our three experts, uh, and uh make your question quick and pointed so that we can get right to the answer. Who wants to start? Okay, Jack, go for it. Morning, guys. Nobody has uh, spoken about immigration at all. We're not talking about those huge immigration numbers anymore. Uh, so question for you guys, what's your what's your sense? Let's say three year prediction. Um, how will the market be absorbing? Well, the, the new people coming in, how will they be absorbing new properties, the new uh, rentals? Uh, kind of what kind of a movement you expect over, let's say, three year period with the effect of immigration? Well, I spoke on immigration, so I did mention it. It's not all time highs, obviously, and that's that's missed, why I'm bullish. I missed yeah. the entry bet. Sorry about that. Ah, okay, no, it's all good. No, so I, like for me, like, and I'm probably the most bullish of our panel. I would think, anyways, based on Twitter. <laughs> um, my my assumption, like, that's what that's why I like the long term story is the cost to build exceeds. So pre construct the cost to build a new condo in Toronto is higher than the resale market value. 
that is always bullish for the long term of the market when replacement cost exceeds existing stock, right? And then in addition to that, we are seeing new housing contract because developers are going, I'm not fucking launching in this market. Who would want to launch in this market? Only the people who need to launch in this market, right? And so nobody's launching the product, which means less new condos are completing in five years at the same time as we're seeing ridiculous levels of immigration. So I think the long-term story for Toronto is as good as it's ever been, but it's naive to think that affordability being down 30, 35%, it can be reconciled just by immigration level. Right. So I think in the short term, like rates tell the story, um, which is, you know, atypical for me to say, but it, it, it's the truth. And then from a pre construction standpoint, I mean, they can't, I mean, the cost to build these things is like 1400 a foot. It's like, you know, at least in the central C1, C01 district. So over the long term, I just don't see how affordability improves. I really don't. Um, yeah, that's my take. Uh, Jack, the only thing I would make, I've said this until I've been blue in the face this year. I'm just going to say it again. Immigration is definitely a factor because the more people that are here, the more demand there is. <clears throat> but remember, the demand for real estate product amongst Canadians is not people-based. It's money-based. More people, more money, to be sure. But when the government of Canada chooses to put more dollars in our pockets, we all collectively use it to buy additional homes. It's not a person factor. It's how much money there is circulating in an economy. Similarly, when there's quantitative tightening, the opposite happens. Um, and so whilst the investor, the immigration discussion is relevant, because 500,000 new people is additional monies and additional buying power and everything else, it's subsumed by the much larger question of, well, okay, the existing 32 million of us or 33 million of us getting our hands on extra dollars, that overwhelms those 500,000 coming in. So I'm just, I'm throwing that out there just because I think it's a more relevant way of thinking about where we're going on a macro basis, not because immigration doesn't affect raw numbers, it does. Yeah, I agree with that too. I think house prices are measured in, in dollars, not people, and the ability to get capital matters. And, you know, people who are immigrating for the most part aren't coming here with huge bags of cash and buying houses. And I think we we have like there, there is historic data on whether or not there is always a lagging effect on something like this. It's not like people move here, buy a house immediately, you know, like go out and, and get into a bidding war, right? Because they want to feel Canadian. Eventually they will buy a house, but they, you know, that'll be often a couple of years, right? They need jobs, they need, and, and the labor market, you know, is it, exceptionally tight right now. And that's a good thing, but it's also, you know, one of the policy, one of the, the major metrics that the Bank of Canada is focusing on from a policy perspective. Um, 89 was the last time we set a, a record on immigration and, and prices fell for four or five years after that. So it, it'll help, I think, in the recovery phase. The other piece is if you look at um, household composition data from the most recent census, two fastest household sizes, fastest growing household sizes, fastest growing household sizes, one, second fastest household, household growing or household size is uh, five plus. So we're seeing a lot of multi-generational household formation because affordability is so bad. So it, what this, if, if prices don't come down to a, a level where it's accessible for everybody to experience the Canadian dream of home ownership, then you'll see what's happening now is you get this, this, this uh, built form composition where you have McMansions and shoe boxes. And McMansions are becoming density concepts more than the shoe boxes are. People are like, and they're, and they're built that way. They're built with individual electrical circuits on every bedroom. They all have a, an ensuite or a Jack and Jill. People, you know, and, and you're seeing a lot of these becoming rooming houses. They have car parking for, for four cars. A lot of young people are living in the roommate scenario, right? And that is in, until uh, affordability corrects, that won't change. And that doesn't necessarily lead to new household formation. It actually, you know, if, if the five plus continues to grow, that's household co consolidation. And that doesn't support house price growth, regardless of how many people you bring in. And how do you guys feel well, about rents? Well, let me, let me just, let me just uh, we are running out of time, but uh, let me just say that I am the original long-term grizzly bear, RE, RE real estate bear. That's me. So, uh, and I will still tell everyone that the level of immigration that we, the level of legal immigration that we have in Canada is an ultimate floor, not an immediate floor, not even a midterm floor, but it is an ultimate floor under real estate prices in Canada. 
that's just the way it is. Uh, you know, I've, I've been around long enough to see all the things you say are true. There was a, a big lull between uh, 1990 and 1996 before um, any sort of price growth occurred. I was there. Uh, I, I actually took advantage of it. But the reality is you bring in half a million people a year, every friggin' year to a country where it's mainly cold in the winter. They will need shelter and eventually we will exhaust uh, those units. Like, let's look, we, we're, we're a 38 million person country who imports one and a half percent of new folks every year. Um, we can have a negative internal birth rate with that. And by the way, the government might decide in 2026, it's 700,000 people. Like sometimes we, you know, the government says we're gonna, we're targeting 500. Oh, look, Ukraine, we need to bring in an extra 150,000. Uh, refugees. So we just keep on adding to it, keep on adding to it. I'm not opposed to it. I'm not. But we got to recognize that it might not have a two-year effect. It might not have a three-year effect. But eventually, it has to have an effect. You bring some, In some cases, we're bringing in 2% of our existing population as new newcomers every year. That's a big number. And it will eventually come home to roost. Not today, not next year, but someday. Yeah, I agree with that outlook. I think one of the challenges I have with immigration data for the previous two quarters is there was a processing lag. Like Ben Tao has been quoted saying, you know, 70% of immigrants in Q2 of last year came from one country. What country was that? It was Canada, right? So there are people who are already here, expiring working visas, whatever it was being pushed into the PR stream. So you know, that obviously those aren't people who are buying houses. That's why maybe we haven't seen the floor effect. Um, I agree long-term, absolutely. We're always going to have more people who want to live it more, more uh, people than houses. And and so that's long-term excess demand. It'll push prices up. But I think for the short term, it's not going to overpower the, the pains that we have. All right, gents, I'm going to allow everyone to have their final words because we're approaching 11 o'clock. So maybe Jordan, we can start with you. Maybe you want to give us a wrap up and then Ron, Dan, and then I'll, I'll say my final words and we'll, we'll call it a day. Yeah, I'll just say like, if people are looking for good deals right now, the best place to do it is the assignment market. I'm Mr. Pre-Condo. I'm in financially incentivized to tell you that pre-construction is the best deal in the world. Right now, the Delta is just too wide. Um, but I think, look, in 10 years, with the level of immigration we're seeing and the, the contraction we're seeing in real time, at least I'm not talk, applying to all of Canada, but just Toronto, I think in 10 years, we're all laughing about about uh, about the 22, 23 rate hike, hike cycle. Um, so I'll just leave it there. Very good. Ron, Dan, either of you? Dan? Yeah, I think I, I echo most of the sentiment here i think in the fullness of time canada is going to be fine um i think that there is some much needed pain in, in the short term that will be a healing factor for the canadian housing market and, and the canadian economy largely and i think we need to see that through and hopefully we learn a lesson and we see more sustainable growth moving forward i'm personally of the, of the perspective that you know millennial investors will have a once in a lifetime buying opportunity over the next 36 months and and i think that we're in a market where it's safe to do that timing it working really hard to find the right deal is 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 going to be what will you know will really be the differentiator for those people looking to invest right now but i think long term the outlook is great this is probably the first time i've actually ever thought that owning a primary residence might actually be economically more sensible you not you know maybe ne next year but if you can buy right more sensible than than renting if you're a good investor so um my 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 sentiments changed a lot i'm almost bullish i would say i think there's a bit more downside but but i'm almost bullish Ron, please. I, I am I am the eternal uh, the eternal bear, but let's let's just put it th this way: it's just going to be about rates. All we need to think about for the next twelve months is rate movement, and that's it. I mean, that is what created the dramatic fall in the in certain locations, certain regions, certain exurb locations uh, in the, in twenty twenty two. Uh, and it's going to continue to be the most impactful issue. I know from time to time people talk about, oh, you know, there's big capital pools sitting out there just waiting to jump on the on good deals. And there is, but it's not enough to meaningfully move the market, number one. And number two, these guys are really smart. I talked to one of the smartest guys in this town who is rich as God and is in the property acquisition business. And his position was, 
Well, whatever is, however bad it is right now, and however bad it is in uh, early 2022, and however bad it is in mid, uh, or sorry, in early 23, and how bad it's going to be in mid 23, I'm going to wait until it's just friggin' hellacious, and then I'm going to get a great deal. So keep in mind that these people with capital, they can also choose to wait. But overall, four years from now, same sentiments as most of the other people. Um, this is a country that needs housing. And it's the, the prices can't stay down forever. I wish they could go a lot lower and then and then stay down for a long time. But you know, we we just can't bring in half a million, seven hundred thousand people and not think that there's eventually going to be some ups upside to this thing. It just could be a long wait. That's all. So, gentlemen, I think I think you guys, the three of you, have succinctly summarized and come to a, a conclusion that I agree with as well. So I don't think there's any need for me to comment. I just want to say thank you. Uh, it means a lot. Your time is incredibly valuable, all three of you. Uh, I think we all benefited from your insights, and I would invite you back for the Crystal Ball session for 2024. Uh, it's interesting. I always watch last year's session before I do this session, um, and it will be interesting to see where we are. Uh, regardless, I would encourage anyone who has direct questions about pre-cons or data or mortgages to reach out to our panelists at any time. They're always available, and they're open to discussion with our professionals. Uh, and I just want to say thank you sincerely. You have made this session what I hoped it would be. Uh, thank you to all and uh, looking forward to uh, making this happen in 2024 and hopefully better times ahead. Thanks again. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thanks. Really appreciate thanks it. Thanks for having me, man. All right, gents. And thank you, everyone. <laughs>